But first of all, we need to talk more about molecular clouds because when there's dust in the interstellar medium, there's also what we call molecular clouds. And that's where the hydrogen doesn't go around as individual atoms, but the atoms pair up and become hydrogen molecules. <coughs> now this can only happen when things are quite cold. Um, and we saw that the temperatures uh, in molecular clouds are very low. And just to remind you that the typical density of a molecular cloud is 10 to the 4. That's 10,000 hydrogen molecules per cubic centimetre. Now that's very, very tenuous, isn't it? That's less than a laboratory vacuum. But astronomers get very excited about this sort of thing because compared to the interstellar medium generally, this is a dense region. And that's why it's called a cloud. And we've got a, a particularly interesting image here of one, the Eagle Nebula. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a little, in a little bit more detail uh, as we go on. But molecular clouds in the space between the stars, we've only known about them for about 40 odd years. Before that, we didn't have the ability to detect them with the various types of telescopes that uh, were available. Um, they're very cold, as we saw just now. Uh, densities you know, can go from 100 to maybe even a million molecules per cubic centimetre. And they have a very similar <coughs> hydrogen-helium uh, ratio as the interstellar medium generally. And there's dust in them. And the important thing is that it's only in molecular clouds that stars form. They can't form anywhere else. And you'll see why as we go on. They don't make up much of the volume of our galaxy, but because they're much denser, they actually make up a large chunk of the interstellar medium mass and they're mainly found in the spiral arms of the galaxy. Uh, now this is a different one here, this is the, the Carina Nebula. Um, you wouldn't actually be able to see it like this with invisible light with your eyes. This is a false colour image uh, where a lot of the emission from this cloud is actually in the infrared um, and the dust in, in, in particular contributes to this. Now these objects are very big. They're typically 300 light years across. Now, 300 light years is very big. Can anyone tell me roughly how far the nearest star is? Four light years. Very good. Four light years. It's at 4.26, I think. Proxima Centauri. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to remember some of these things. Um, it's a very small, insignificant star, but it is the closest. But four light years is a long, long way. Um, even, even if you were down at the speed of light, it still takes you four years <laughs> to get there. Um, so if you think 300 light years, that's huge. Our solar system, how long does it take a radio signal, which travels at the speed of light, how long does it take a radio signal to get to, say, Saturn, you think, when NASA has got its, you know, the Hygens probe there? Eight Rough minutes. Eight minutes. Um, eight minutes is a good number but it's the time it takes light from the sun to get to the Earth. So you remembered that, didn't you? Okay, so out to Saturn's a bit further. You've just got the thing, you know, you've got the, 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 the amount of time right, just the wrong object. See, we learn things at school, we don't always remember them right, do we? Um, so a signal to Saturn, or a signal coming back from Saturn, from one of the probes. Um, it's a bit longer than eight minutes. No, nowhere near as long as that. A day? A second? It's about, I think it's four or five hours. So, that, so the speed of light uh, takes... So that gives you an idea of how big the solar system is. It's sort of about, well, let's say ten light hours in diameter. Just a rough number. Out to, say, Saturn or somewhere like that. Now these objects, they're 300 light years. It takes 300 years for a signal to go from one side of a molecular cloud to another. So they're very big. And although the density is very low, it adds up to a lot of material, a lot of material. Now we've got this number here, the free fall time, a million years. What that means is that this molecular cloud, if gravity could just collapse it, without anything stopping the collapse going on, it would take about a million years for the cloud to collapse in on itself. 
just using a simple physical model. You've probably read some of this stuff while I've been talking. Um, so they're clumpy and bumpy. Well, that's pretty obvious from this image, isn't it? Um, they're the biggest objects in the galaxy, uh, biggest objects in the universe, actually. Um, and they, for instance, look at this. A big molecular cloud, the amount of mass it contains is a million suns. So if you could get a molecular cloud and convert it to stars, you'd get a million stars like our sun out of one molecular cloud. So can you see that because they're very big, and although they're not very dense, there's a huge amount of material in them. And that's why they are the only places that you can create stars. Now, a typical galaxy like ours might have a thousand of these big molecular clouds. Now, we can only see some of them from where we are in our part of the galaxy. Now, something else that we find in molecular clouds, and this has been, again, not known for more than uh, sort of 30 or 40 years, is that they're full of chemical molecules. Now, for instance, what we find is that they contain carbon monoxide, um, ionized hy hydrogen-3, um, formaldehyde, um, ammonia, methane, methanol, hydrogen cyanide, and more than a, about 130 other molecules, chemicals, are, are found in the interstellar medium. And this was a big surprise to people, to astronomers early on, when they started discovering all this chemistry that is in molecular clouds. And as we'll see, it's very important. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some of my own research, because molecular clouds is what I look at. Here's that uh, diagram of our galaxy again. And there are a couple of molecular clouds right out away on the edge of the galaxy and that's why we, we call them edge cloud one edge cloud two and there are some others and um, i've actually been over the last few years looking at this one edge cloud two it's a long way away um, it's about fifty thousand light years from, <coughs> from our solar system and what we do we go to a telescope and in this case it's uh, the james clark maxwell telescope which is in hawaii on the big island on top of Mauna Kea, um, a very big ancient uh, volcano. It's very high, the air's very dry, the weather's very good, which is why you go to these sorts of places, so you're higher, so you're looking through less atmosphere. Uh, it's generally very dry, uh, which is very important because water vapour in the atmosphere plays havoc with um, astronomical observations. Now what we do, we use a, um, a radio telescope, so it's a dish, You've probably seen images of the uh, Lovell radio telescope at Jogrell Bank. Um, and uh, what we do, we tune the telescope, just like when you're tuning a radio station with an old-fashioned radio, turning the knob. Uh, we don't quite turn the knob, but we tune them to a particular frequency. Because carbon monoxide is a molecule, and it, at very low temperatures, like 20 degrees Kelvin, that molecule be, will be rotating. And the molecule is in a sea of hydrogen it's surrounded by. So it's been buffeted by that hydrogen. And that buffeting sort of knocks the molecule into an excited state, so it sort of rotates faster. But then it will spontaneously decay and drop down to a, a lower rotational state. And in doing so, it has to lose energy. So it gives off a photon of <coughs> radio light. Um, it's about 115 gigahertz is the frequency, and that's what we pick up with the telescope. We pick up that radio um, light that the, the molecules are giving off. So carbon monoxide uh, is a very good starting point when you want to sort of try and see a molecular cloud. So what we do, we point the, the telescope at a series of positions and make an observation, and we build them up, and from all the observations we can create a map, like a contour map. So the darker regions are where there is more carbon monoxide emitting uh, towards us. So we create a map, and these two different regions are in the right sort of spatial relationship to each other. And we can see that this cloud 
uh, indeed is sort of clumpy and lumpy, and it has two sort of dense regions here and here. And uh, some colleagues in Japan have been looking at this object in the visible light and in the infrared, and what they've discovered is young stars, uh, a clump of young stars here and a clump of young stars there. So this molecular cloud, star formation is already going on in it. So that was uh, pretty interesting to us. Um, the question we ask ourselves, well, what has made this cloud start generating stars? It needs a trigger. And the trigger we found is that there is a, a supernova remnant, a star that went supernova, a star that exploded in the past, not too far away. Now, in this uh, illustration, this is where uh, we believe the, the star that uh, exploded uh, originated. And when a star explodes, it sends a shock wave through the interstellar medium. You know, you drop a, drop a stone into a pond, you get ripples. Well, you have a, a big star explode, there is a shock wave, a ripple passes through the surrounding interstellar medium. It keeps on going. And what we've worked out, this happened um, a few million years ago, uh, the supernova. And the shock wave has passed through the region of this molecular cloud, perhaps, in, perhaps a million years ago, maybe even more recently. Um, and it, we can see that because I, if I just, um, I'll just flip back. Can you see the contours here are very squashed up, very close together, but they're not squashed up as much this side. Whereas this part of the cloud, there's a squashing up on both sides. The, the intensity builds up very quickly. So uh, our interpretation of this is that this shock wave, which has moved in this direction, has compressed the cloud on this side. We think there's some other event has taken place over here, so that this part of the cloud has, has been compressed from both sides. And in each case, this has, uh, has caused the cloud to collapse in on itself and to get denser, and we believe it's what has triggered the star formation that has been uh, discovered there. So that gives us a good idea of what's going on.